Hi there. Uh, most of you know me. Um, I'm Dr. Eric Spann. This is my wife, Carrie. She's really looking forward to doing this. She doesn't mind doing these tapings at all. And hopefully through the wonder of technology, we will take this little green screen that we've set up and uh, share with you by video and audio uh, along with our slideshow and uh, the handouts that we have. Uh, we'll be able to share with you some of the things that we've learned and some of the things that we've grown through in our own marriage. And we'll get to have some fun along the way with some uh, B-roll footage and some other things like this little clip. It's not in my folder. I don't know. I didn't do nothing. No. Um, okay. Um, hold on. <laughs> I got that on tape, by the way. <laughs> that goes okay. in the B-roll. <laughs> Fornication and fantasy, equal opportunity bondage. As you go through this series with us, you're going to notice that we have a handout for you that will follow the, the content, and then you'll see some information that will come up in the screen from Carrie and I about um, all this information, some visual references that we put together that would be the slideshow if you were physically present in Gulf Shores with us. So to start with, let me just give you a quote from Dr. Marianne Layden. Our society has become pornified. She's a psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, and this is her area of research, and she's probably the national expert on the societal and cultural effects of pornography. One disclaimer, uh, Carrie and I, neither one, have viewed any pornographic information, read anything pornographic, viewed any videos or pictures, to give you this content. Uh, this is all from research done through Covenant Eyes and through medical literature and uh, we just want you to know that this is something you can learn about without having to involve yourself in it. There is a destruction that can await you and I if we're not careful. I have a friend who I shared the word with, prayed with, taught, mentored, who is now in prison for over 30 years because he did not get this issue of sensuality fantasy and ultimately what led to a pornographic lifestyle uh, so his life is functionally over and he will never see his children again in their lifetime more than likely but we have other examples that are from scripture such as solomon solomon is a horror story solomon tried everything to satisfy his flesh he had no desire left out uh, you saw the pictures uh, you know men think that if we had our desires um, in front of us the way that we wanted them, that we could make ourselves happy. Solomon had access to uh, every beautiful woman in the world of every exotic style and type. They were trained for over a year in their culture to just satisfy his fleshly lust. And most men, and, and in a different way women, think that if we just had things the way we want them, that we would be satisfied. But this is a lie. Just look at Solomon's life. He said, I tried everything, and nothing satisfied me. No desire was left out. He said, yeah, I enjoyed the rush and excitement short term, but it left him frustrated and depressed and empty. And that would have been his medical history had he come to me in this day and age. And his physical exam would have probably looked like this. A hollow marriage, strained relations, failed health, a lonely life, and ultimately depression and disillusionment. Um, the, the scripture is very clear that for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And that's Romans 8, 6. Also, you see in Scripture, uh, Paul, Solomon said this. He said, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept, not from them. I kept it not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. He said, Therefore I hated life, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So, Solomon had nothing that he got, uh, that his flesh didn't get that he wanted, and it made him miserable. And we should take that into account and counsel from God for our own lives. Also, regarding this thing of marriage and sensuality, God counseled that we should drink waters out of our own cistern, that we should let our fountains be dispersed abroad, and that is intensely sexual language. He said that our fountains should be with our own and not with strangers. Not with strangers. Think about that. He, said the, he asked the rhetorical question, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravaged with a strange woman? Proverbs 5, 15 to 20, those are excerpts. He counseled us to drink waters out of our own cistern. So there's some wisdom in that, 
that we see that there's, there's a possibility of going outside of what is our own, our possession, uh, what we're licensed to, versus those that are strange or strangers. And that it's absolute foolishness and folly. Uh, we're to avoid fornication in the scripture we see in, in 1 Corinthians. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and like, likewise also the wife unto the husband. The scripture says that the wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Of course, we look at that differently probably. In the Scripture, we are counseled, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New, to only take advantage of what God has provided for us that's real and that's right in front of us that we're authorized to enjoy and take advantage of. In the um, Old Testament, we're told to let our fountains be blessed and to rejoice with the wife of our youth, to let her be as the loving hind and the pleasant robe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou always ravished with her love. You'll see that I've highlighted the words wife, her, her, and her about love, and that it's a focus on our particular own wife men. And you could translate that into those things that would be counsel for ladies. Now he goes and says, let thy fountain be blessed. He uses words that, are, uh, that we all desire, blessed, rejoice, pleasant, satisfy, loving, all times, ravished, and again, love. And that word love in the Old Testament is distinctly sexual. So we've got counsel from Scripture. I want to share with you a quote that changed my life. In two th Godliness and sensuality are mutually exclusive, and those in the grasp of sensuality can never rise to godliness while in its sweaty grip. So from Solomon, from Paul, from wise counselors and pastors that are national teachers, you see the principle that sensuality is not going to satisfy, even though our culture is saturated with it. Now, Carrie's going to share some different things with you regarding a coming disaster and some of the things that she learned and that we shared during our studies. These are the shocking numbers that are affecting our culture. 35% of all Internet downloads are pornography. Over 40 million Americans regularly visit pornographic sites. In 2017, 4,052,542 pornographic videos were uploaded, and 13% of all searches were for erotic content. So I'm going to share with you, as she talks about the ladies, just some statistics. When you look at these graphs that we've put up, you'll see on the left a darker color, or a lighter color yellow, and on the right a darker one. And what you see is that 79% of men ages 18 to 30 view pornography weekly to monthly. And by the same token, if you look at men in an older age, 31 to 49 year olds, about 61% look at pornography at least monthly. 49% of men in retirement age, or near that, view pornography weekly to monthly. But when you look at the more frequent use, 67% of young men under 30 years of age view pornography weekly, and 38% of men ages 31 to 49 view pornography daily to weekly, and even 25% of men over 50 years of age view pornography daily to weekly. And I can attest that this is probably right from the men that I survey in my practice. But the shocking statistic is that 76% of women 18 to 30 view pornography weekly to monthly, almost the same percentage as the men. So you see that there's something that's changed culturally uh, in the time that people that are over 50 years of age, at least women, there's a big cultural change. She's got some other information that we found fascinating. Talking about location and circumstances, there was a college study done, 16... 615 college students were surveyed. 83% of the boys and 57% of girls had seen group sex online. 81% began to use pornography at home. The majority viewed it in their bedroom while their parents were at home. 57% of them had accessed pornography on their smartphones and the reason that they gave for viewing was out of boredom. 
and 15% of boys and 9% of girls have seen child pornography. If you look at all the statistics, those that are happily married are 61% less likely to view pornography. And a warm parent-child relationship is the most important factor in reducing pornography abuse among children. Zip codes that have enacted conservative legislation on sexuality and hold more conservative religious views on gender roles and such are more likely to subscribe to paid pornography. In regions where people regularly attend church, there are, they are more likely to have subscriptions, but the subscriptions will be less likely to be, to be initiated on Sundays. Amazing. So when we when we started looking into the statistics on this, I, I really expected that most pornography is probably viewed from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. The shocking statistic is that 70% of pornography is viewed from between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. The U.S. government actually had to redirect funds to monitor pornography on government employee websites and the money was redirected from uh, grant grant from th this was another thing that that really shocked me is they um, they surveyed a group of Millennials and they gave them two choices and asked which is less moral and 32% said that pornography was less moral. 56% stated that not recycling was less moral. So, so we, have a, we have a problem in that we have a generation that, that views not recycling as a bigger problem than viewing pornography. Which is where, going back to what she found earlier, is that women, young women, for whatever reason, I think it's culturally the expectation of men, because men are just obsessed and addicted, is that women are now feeling like they have to compete or keep up with or act like um, pornographic models, and men expect this. And you see that show up when you look at the morality, is, is pornography is becoming just a daily part of the life of those under 30 years of age. And this is going to have some vast implications that Carrie will talk more about later. What I'd like to talk to you about now is this ugly reality because men especially and even more women now than ever before are, are having this fantasy life that involves visual pornography, internet pornography, etc. And the, the, some things that I found as, as we searched. There was a study done in 2010 and they looked at 304 pornographic scenes and what they found was just three things, and we've condensed a lot of this for time's sake. 88% of those scenes contain physical aggression toward women. 49% contain verbal aggression toward women. And the women reacted either neutrally or positively to those demeaning and degrading verbal and physical um, manifestations toward them. So you can imagine what that does to the female mind, uh, uh, and the male mind especially, about what women really want. Now I'll give you some other statistics. One male performer, his name's Rocco, uh, was quoted as, uh, and he's been involved with over 3,000 women and done 600 videos, and he said this, every professional in the porn world has herpes, whether male or female. A former female performer uh, said something very graphic, and I've changed the words a little bit. She says, guys are punching you in the face. You get and she said a word, genital lacerations. Uh, she said, your, your insides come out of you, and it's never ending. She said, you're not a human with a spirit. You're just an object. Uh, a female pornography researcher, when looking at the lives of these uh, pornography performers that are female, said they have to either be drunk or high or disassociated in order to even go to work. Their work environment is particularly toxic and terrible. And you can imagine from what the man said that that's probably true. One other female performer said this. She said, we binged on ecstasy, cocaine, marijuana, Xanax, Valium, Vicodin, alcohol, 
just anything to get us through the day doing what we were doing. Dr. Layden, who I mentioned before, says this. She said, pornography teaches some things. She says it teaches this. She said, all people want sex all the time with all other people, was one quote. Number two was, pornography teaches that women really do enjoy being degraded. She said it teaches that sex is not about caring and intimacy or love or respect. Sex is a non-interactive and objective adversarial relationship. She said that pornography teaches that sex with strangers is the best and most intense sex. And I think that anybody that's ever been trapped in this or in bondage to it or been exposed repeatedly would agree that everything that she says is true about pornography. Everything in the world of intimacy and love is turned on its head. And that is why we see some of the things that we're starting to see in our society, even down to grade school. One of the other quotes of Dr. Layden was this. She said, consumers of pornography eventually compare the appearance and performance of the pornographic models that they see with that of their real mates. And this comparison rarely favors the mates. And I think women suffer that uh, feeling a lot if their husbands or their significant others are involved in pornography. She says, it's all a lie. Long-term married monogamous people are having the most sex and the most satisfying sex. One of the things that Dr. Layden said that I find interesting and, and really important is this. She said, pornography is the perfect teacher except that everything that it says is a lie. That's powerful. Pornography perverts and warps your soul and your mind. And it does this and it alters your brain as well as a process. And this is prophesied and this is discussed in the Old Testament in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. Jeremiah said this to the people. It says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 15. When you and I expose ourselves to anything that is evil, anything that's sinful over and over, and we start to depend on it for stimulation or pleasure or any of the other things that God promises through His Son, and through the Word, and through a relationship that's personal with Him. We are going to be changed by it. These people were so warped in their lifestyle that they no longer had the ability to even blush, which is the most natural response even of a little child when it's exposed to something shameful. But if we keep exposing ourselves, and we keep going after certain sins, we're going to be changed, and it's going to change us permanently, and only God then can reverse that. And an example of that is we lose the normal response to stimulation, which is why pornography addicts never get enough, and it's never uh, different enough, and the women are never young enough, and this is how people can be drawn from a normal life into something as sick and perverted as child pornography even, because nothing sinful satisfies, and you have to have more and more and more and more perverse images and more perverse uh, situations to stimulate that system that God meant to be satisfied only by what He provided in the relationship of marriage, purity before marriage, and then purity afterwards in a monogamous, loving, committed relationship with that one man or woman that God has you uh, authorized to have love and access with. So think about that as we go on. Some other things that you might consider. Um, Dr. Mary Ann Layden said some, there's some common things that occur, some attitudinal and behavioral changes that take place in men who regularly expose themselves and become addicted to pornography. One is erectile dysfunction. Two is premature ejaculation. Then there's retar retarded ejaculation. There's reduced sexual satisfaction in the vast majority of men to the point that 58% of men who regularly expose themselves to pornography have erectile dysfunction with a real woman but none with pornography even though their requirements are greater in volume, intensity, and perversion along the way. Jill Mann, who researches pornography um, and who was quoted alongside Dr. Mary Ann Layden, says to those points that pornography damages the sexual performance of the viewers, raising their expectations and demand 
but reducing their very ability to experience the thing that they want. And that's exactly how sin is. Also, Dr. Layden said one final thing in a talk that I heard. She says, pornography is the only drug that never leaves your system. And I think that's one of the reasons that we need to pull ourselves out of this worldly promise of sensual fulfillment back to the promises that God makes in marriage and family. So you'll notice at the top of your handout in the introduction, I left out a letter, and it was the first letter, A, a description. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about this. I'm going to give you a description and tell me what I'm talking about. One party in a marriage has a secret fantasy life that they indulge that makes them think uh, sexually and emotionally and relationally about someone who is not their spouse, and it drives them to think that they wish their spouse was different and that they would behave differently and that they would seek to please them more in certain ways. What am I talking about? You may have said pornography, but it's romance novels. 